We are here today, of course, remembering the life of Kenyon Youngstrom. Ken was a member of our church, but he was more than just a member. He was a personal friend of mine. As we've heard, Kenyon was the kind of guy that when you first met him, you instantly bonded with him. He had the knack of making you feel like you were his best friend. He was very personable. He was the guy you kind of wanted to be around. And that's what makes today a difficult day, doesn't it? Well, it's in times like this that we need unshakable faith. And Kenyon had that. When calamity comes and heartaches come and troubles are multiplied, you need an anchor for the soul. And Kenyon had that anchor. That anchor is Jesus Christ. Let me just share with you briefly about what Jesus said about himself. This is from Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4. Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Jesus here is explaining what he came into the world to do. And what he came to do was deliver people. And the people he describes here are those who have experienced the dominating power and devastating effects of the most severe emotional and personal problems. And what Jesus is claiming is that he is able to heal and restore and deliver broken and downtrodden people. That's what he's able to do. There is no problem beyond his delivering power. No one else can do what he claimed to do and what he can do. So let me just note a few things. First, Jesus says that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Jesus came to preach the gospel to the poor. The, the gospel is good news. And Jesus says, I've come into the world with some good news. We need that. Because as you know, this world is filled with bad news. When the officer, Martin Linway, called me, who also goes to our church last week, as all of you were, we were stunned. You need good news in the midst of bad news. Jesus says, I've come to share with you, to proclaim to you some good news. Well, what is that? What is the good news? Here it is. You can be forgiven of your sins and be reconciled to God. God in his great kindness and love has provided a way for you to be reconciled to him. And the reason why you need to be reconciled is because you have greatly offended him. The scriptures say all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's no exception to this. We're all guilty. We all deserve judgment. But the good news is, the astounding news is this. God took the initiative to forgive you of your sins and reconcile you to himself. And he did that by sending his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die in your place. For your sins, as your substitute, so you could be forgiven. You know, as I was thinking about what happened to Ken, it really pictures, in a small way, what Christ did. 
Ken's job was to protect us from bad people. And he gave the ultimate sacrifice. He gave his life while he was serving and protecting us from someone evil. And we recognize him as a hero. He was. But in an infinitely greater way, Jesus came into this world to be our protector. That's why he came into the world. But the one he came to protect us from is ourselves. Listen to me. We are that evil person. The wrath of God should have rightly fallen on us, but Jesus Christ stood in the gap. He got between us and the fierce wrath of God, and he absorbed it for us. Jesus is the greatest hero. He's the greatest hero. And through God, through him, God offers you forgiveness. But you need to recognize something about yourself before you ever receive this. Jesus said he came to preach the gospel to the poor. This good news is for poor people. Who are they? Who are the poor? They are people who have nothing, and they know it. They don't have anything to offer God. Most people think that the way to get right with God is by doing something good. I, I need to go to church. I need to obey the Ten Commandments. What God is telling us is there's nothing you can do to appease him. All your works, even if they're so-called good ones, are filthy rags to God. We are poor. The only thing we have to offer God is sin, for which he will judge us. You cannot deliver yourself. What God wants you to do is simply trust in Christ. Put your faith in the finished work of Christ, the one who died in your place. That's what he wants you to do. That's what Ken did. Ken, Ken's in heaven, not because he was a good person. Ken is in heaven because he's a forgiven person. He had trusted Christ. And if there's anything about his death that should shout to us is this. We may not have a tomorrow. We may not have a tomorrow. There's no guarantee of that. The Bible says life is a vapor. We need to get right with God now. And the good news is you can by trusting Christ. But that's not all Jesus came to do. Jesus says, not only does he, did he come to preach the gospel, he was sent to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. Jesus gives sight to blind people. And what he helps them see is who he is. He helps them see his glory. That's what he helps them see. People are blinded to the glory of Christ. They don't understand what makes him famous. They think he maybe was a good teacher or a prophet or something like that. Jesus helps you see who he really is. Well, who is he? Jesus is God. That's who he is. He's equal with the Father because he has the exact same nature as the Father. Hebrew says he's the radiance of God's glory. Whatever makes God glorious, Jesus radiates. He shines forth his glory because he is the exact representation of his nature. The fullness of deity dwells in him. So Jesus says, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And what Jesus helps you see about him is this, that this great God, who is equal with the Father, willingly humbled himself to become a man, and God became a man to die in your place for your sin so that you could be forgiven. Can anyone be more glorious than that? Can anyone be more worthy of our trust and allegiance? 
But Jesus does more. For those who have trusted him, he comes and he sets free the, the oppressed. That's what he does. He comes and delivers those who are oppressed, who are broken and who are crushed by life circumstances like we are here today. Crushed by life circumstances. Beaten down by the troubles of life and the tribulations of life. And, and there's nothing we can change about what happened. Jesus says, I come to deliver such people. So I don't, only, I don't only proclaim deliverance, I actually deliver people. That's what he claims. And he has all the resources to meet every need because his resources are infinite. He has infinite power. He can deliver you. He has infinite love. He can comfort you. He knows how to comfort you. He has infinite wisdom. He can help you. He's the good shepherd. And he knows how to comfort his people. You see, the degree of your problems are not an issue to him. They're not an issue to him. He's able to meet any emotional and spiritual need because he is the all-sufficient Savior. That's who Jesus Christ is. And when you put your trust in him, you will have unshakable faith even in the midst of great tribulation because he is the rock. Jesus is the fortress. He is our refuge, our deliverer. That's who Christ is. There's no one like him. No one. Friends, I would exhort you today. Trust in Christ. Trust in this one. He was the one Kin trusted in. And Kin had good fruit there. He had some good fruit, as you've heard all these testimonies. Jesus is the only one who can deliver you and forgive your sins. Jesus is the only one who will become a shepherd to you and comfort you in times of trouble. In this world, you have tribulation. But take courage, he says, I've overcome the world. I've overcome the world. What a glorious Lord and Savior. That's who can trust it in. That's who he trusted. And we're going to miss our brother. I'm going to miss his smile. I'm going to miss his funny things, funny faces and stories that he told. But we know he's with Christ because he trusted Christ. Will you? Why don't we pray together? Lord, we, in the midst of these troubles, we want to thank you for a message of hope. Lord, this wasn't an accident. Lord, you have sovereignly decreed all things. You oversee the good and the bad. So it was no accident what happened to Ken. Though we mourn his loss, we know you have good purposes for it. And you wanted him to be with you. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones, Psalm 116 says. It's precious in your sight, not in ours, but in yours, because you welcome him home. Lord, work today. Work in the hearts of these people who are grieving and mourning. Help us to see. Lord, life is short. It'll soon be over, and we're going to meet you, and we're going to meet Jesus Will we meet him as Lord and judge or Savior? So do your work here and be glorified, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. This concludes the memorial service for Officer Kenyon Youngstrom, 18063. Have a good day. Have a good day.
Will you all please stand? There will be a private internment and immediately following the internment and reception for anyone that would like to attend. Will you please remain seated? Correction. Will you please remain standing while all family, Golden Gate Division, and Contra Costa CHP personnel who arrived with the procession and will be attending the private internment, as well as Karen's family, which was transported by bus, please exit through the main doors and stage outside. Welcome back. You've been watching special live coverage of the funeral of CHP officer Kenyon Youngstrom. 70-year veteran was just 37 years old, married with four children ages 5 through 17. Officer Youngstrom is survived by his parents and his six siblings, two sisters and four.